Welcome everybody to Federation Hall and to Art Forum. My name is David Sequera. I'm the director of the Fiona and Sydney Meyer Gallery here at the VCA, and I also program Art Forum. And before I introduce our guest speaker, I do invite you to ground yourself in the deep knowledge that long before the VCA was thought of or the University of Melbourne was considered that the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation practiced song and dance here. They shared stories, they practiced healing, they made paintings and sculptures here. And it's really with great joy um, and honour that we acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. So our guest speaker, Irina Danilova. Born and raised in Kharkiv, Ukraine, multimedia artist and curator Irina Danilova is going to discuss her experiences and present a selection of international um, artworks collected from social media. Now, um, I'm not sure if anybody came to Irina's last um, lecture here at the VCA, which was pretty amazing and focused um, on a project called Project 59 um, that she'd been working on for quite a while. But today she's not going to talk necessarily about Project 59. She's going to be talking about uh, a topic that's very dear to her heart, and that is... Um, art and war, and art and war for Irina are mutually exclusive concepts. They correspond to creation and destruction. While the concept of destruction is not alien to modern art, war deteriorates life while becoming part of it. War stifles creativity. It eliminates lightheartedness and suppresses the playfulness in art. So the subject of this presentation is art during wartime, the transformation of artists, and the changes in the perception of art. Wherever you are, in Zoom land or in Federation Hall, please make Irina very welcome. Thank you, David. Uh, first of all, I, I want to uh, say thank you to David, Sean, and June for organizing this event. Uh, it is very important to me because I was uh, raised in Ukraine. I was born in Ukraine. And Ukraine still uh, has a lot of my friends and relatives. So today we are going to talk about war in Ukraine and art. And uh, uh, pictures that I will show you, they have two um, collections. One uh, anonymous, pictures that I cannot uh, say the name without um, permission. And uh, another picture that artists gave to me um, their works, and uh, I will definitely introduce their names as well. And I am honored here to uh, introduce five prominent uh, young Ukrainian artists, women artists uh, who were developed as an artist during the war, because I want you to remember that war in Ukraine uh, didn't start on. 24th of February, it started in 2014 with uh, annexing of uh, Crimea, occupation of Crimea, literally, and it was going on war for Ukrainian people. And of course, the uh, huge scale of war and occupation started in February. So here I start with the first slide. Uh, you could see some uh, remnants of Guernica, of Pablo Picasso. Why it's remnants? Because uh, uh, as Second World War overshadowed somehow the First World War uh, by you know by mm, size and scale, um, for everybody who was born in Russia or Ukraine, at least, and probably for many more people, uh, this war overshadows the Second uh, the World War II. And also, unfortunately, the World War II um, was used as a uh, propaganda machine for the propaganda machine uh, falsely uh, by Putin regime. So um, we are going straight to. If we're going straight to. Okay. Okay, <laughs> we're going straight to Gernika, which is uh, more. Um, full version of it. But I would like to uh, get your attention to picture on the top. So this uh, uh, mural uh, or painting by Pablo Picasso he, uh, was done after the uh, um, destruction of the city. 
And this destruction of the city remind me uh, some Ukrainian cities such as Mariupol or my uh, Kharkiv that was destructed and still destructed every day uh, with rockets. Uh, so we could see uh, scenery from the from Kharkiv. And also this is very famous um, war-related painting of uh, Vasily Verishagin. He was painting it uh, for the Turkestan war, which was another Russian um, uh, huge war against small nations. And uh, uh, this painting he devoted to every uh, aggressive conquirer of the world in the past, in the in the uh, future and in the present. So uh, here is a map of uh, Europe. And you could see in Europe, Ukraine is actually the biggest country of Europe. Yes, I uh, made Crimea part of Ukraine as well, because it is, uh, and it's supposed to be part of Ukraine. Uh, it's just occupied, temporarily occupied by Russia. But anyway, I wanted to uh, take your attention that uh, Ukraine is the biggest country in um, Europe. And also, if I uh, want to go back, you could see the outline of this pile kind of remind us outline of the Europe together with Ukraine. So I really hope that we are not going to come to this with this. And uh, we are facing power and we are facing uh, destruction. We are facing the terror. Uh, that unfortunately may destroy uh, part of our world, which is very important uh, part of uh, democratic world that Europe is. Here is a map uh, with uh, size of Russia and size of Ukraine on the side. So apparently it is a bully war. It's a war of a giant against a uh, smaller country. Uh, although this territory is not occupied as much as Ukrainian territory, we could see that its um, population is three point something time as much, but still it's a huge giant country with a lot of more resources uh, and power than Ukraine. That's why I uh, myself, I could not uh, do anything when I heard about war in Ukraine. I, uh, I could not continue with my project 59 that is is playful project and there was no option to be playful in this situation. So I started to cry out and I started to cry out in um, the series of national flags. Uh, first flag of course support Ukraine. It was the first days of the war. Stop bloody aggression on a flag of uh, Russia. Here, I want to just remind you that in 1994, there was a, a Budapest Memorandum of Security when uh, I still don't understand how and why, but actually Ukraine was um, agreed to give up all the nuclear missiles and all the weapon to Russia for some reason and in exchange for uh, you know security of the borders of Ukraine. Apparently, Russia didn't uh, hold this um, board or uh, you know agreement and uh, in a way I, I have to say that you know I, I am not a person for military and I would say Ukraine back then it was not a martial law it was no uh, nothing specific to uh, cut Ukraine out of weapon so Ukraine was a country of the future like ideal country without weapon without you know power just a countries that builds up some democracy or going toward democracy. Um, but now we could see that it's not an option, unfortunately yet. So that's why my uh, next cry out would uh, were to the countries that signed this um, agreement as well, together with Russia that didn't hold it. And it's of course, uh, United States and uh, United Kingdom. So then I made this uh, video based on this national project.
first uh, 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 pictures that I saw on uh, uh, internet in a, uh, social media that really moved me. It was a picture of this uh, uh, elderly woman that was uh, showing uh, yellow and blue uh, colors of the Ukrainian flag. It was very early in, uh, you know, after the beginning of the war, because later you couldn't even show any yellow and blue together. You would just go to the prison or arrested or um, beaten up. So on the left, you could see the guy in the coat and he uh, apparently wearing his grandfather's coat, saying that my grandfather went through World War II and he was afraid of it. I am afraid of this war, I don't want it. Another anti-war uh, installation was in Yekaterinburg in Russia. So both works uh, were in Russia, which was quite brave and early in uh, during the war. This was a uh, work in Yekaterinburg that says, common says warning, special military operation is killing people. So uh, this artist went to prison and uh, I don't know about his, um, what, what he's doing right now and where he is. Uh, as well as those artists were uh, also punished. And uh, you could see, uh, this is kind of like Russians trying to understand what's going on, how they could you know, live in Russia. And on the left, it's St. Petersburg uh, artist uh, making performance in the, on the street. Mm -hmm. And on the right, you could see two artists, uh, two women who are standing in front of the Ministry of um, uh, foreign uh, affairs and uh, on, on the right it's apparently a picture based uh, performance but still they were punished after that and uh, imprisoned. This one is outside of Russia it's one of the first and as you know after news about Bucha it was a wave of different performances in front of Russian consulates the one of the first one if not the first was in uh, Tallinn Estonia and this one in front of Russian consulates there. This is quite a famous um, uh, stop sign uh, installations in the city. It's, it started back in 70s with uh, Vietnam War, stop war signs, and now we, ha we have a new variation of it in New York. Here is Melbourne, Australia. You could see uh, tiles uh, made of concrete and painted in yellow and blue uh, colors of flag, Ukrainian flag. Uh, one of the tiles is prominently installed uh, in one of the um, uh, railway stations. Um, some tiles uh, you, you probably could see around the city. <coughs> it was also made uh, pretty early in uh, concrete was kind of like metaphoric or uh, showed the strengths of Ukrainian people. Here is Ukrainian uh, performance, uh, uh, soldiers playing chess with Molotov cocktail. And here is a, a first artist I would like to introduce, artist uh, who lives in Bulgaria. She was born and raised in Kharkiv. Uh, we were raised together, it's my childhood friend. She lived in Bulgaria for, for a long time, so she's a Bulgarian artist right now. And uh, she's uh, making uh, such a pictures, war journal, showing horrors and pain of the war. So destruction, will of destruction is going uh, through the Ukrainian cities. Uh, birch trees are soaked in blood. <clears throat> and here, her famous uh, painting back in from 2015. Apologize. <coughs> and it's like nightmare. This is her work also, and it says um, life is painful um, in Russian. So this work actually she made um, for in 2017, and she was literally sick by then. And uh, she made this work, but uh, from perspective of the war, of course, it's kind of like uh, I, I included it in this collection because it, it does uh, say what it's going right now. Um, it's a beautiful kind of like, you know, um, pillow. Uh, we still continue with our lives. Lives and didn't change much except for the pain. Pain that goes 
all the time inside along with this work. Here is a work of Carly Spiller and uh, Julian McDonald. Uh, it was made back in 2002, but because of the message for protection against greedy war enthusiasts and their actions uh, that was sewn on the hat, kind of like uh, Ukrainian Russian hat uh, of the artist whose um, uh, parents came from Ukraine uh, or grandparents in this case. And uh, I was, you know, it's, it's kind of like artistic way to protect, uh, making kind of like artistic helmet, so to speak, for the head. And here is a first Ukrainian young artist, Maria Pashkovska, and her uh, piece uh, that she uh, made her first performance with this piece 62 hours before the beginning of the war. She didn't know that war will start, of course, and she was in some vicinity of Kiev. She's artist from Kiev. She was born in Kiev, lives in Kiev. Now she lives in Lviv because of the uh, aggression uh, against the Kiev in the beginning of the war. So she, <clears throat> apologize, uh, here we are. This is performance, this is video performance. So she created kind of like her own weapon of uh, defense. And this, thank you. This, this weapon of defense made of mortar, uh, pretty old Ukrainian uh, mortar and uh, uh, Ukrainian, uh, old Ukrainian uh, coins. So she's, apparently she's sharpening coins to be ready to defense herself and her country. She repeated this performance uh, later on in uh, this spring in um, Bologna, Italy. And uh, it was in a library uh, that also a center of women, uh, uh, empowered women. Here is a library. And this work of her doesn't need any notes. Uh, the arc number, her birth date. And again, these artists were working already during the war that was on an ongoing war with uh, Russia in Donbass all the time. Another artist from Ukraine, Olya Fedorova, she is uh, also from Kharkiv, and she lives in Kharkiv all the time, uh, except for now she lives in Austria because she. Uh, fleet from Kharkiv <coughs> when it started, war started, but she made her installation on the left, you could see her installation, protecting her uh, land, uh, in, made of course of uh, paper uh, installation, uh, and uh, you could see what struck me is that uh, re recently I uh, ran over this work of uh, Elisa Vladio uh, about stitching the borders. So it's kind of like the same image almost like, you know, this X shapes and uh, work, uh, artwork of uh, peacetime and artwork of wartime, artwork of the artist who um, has <clears throat> the, you know, fear or aggression uh, of the war. Here is uh, one of her pieces also, uh, I don't know where I am, but it is my home. So on the left, you could see uh, in the background the pipe of Azastal, the last, you know, uh, fort of uh, Mariupol. And on the right, of course, it's a, a symbol of uh, Ukrainian flag. Another work of Olya Fedorova is uh, doing yoga in the burnt woods. I connected together two pictures of this performance. So this apparently is performance about how life uh, is going on back even if in Kharkiv, I constantly talking to my friends in Kharkiv and you know, they're going on with their lives even though ra rockets shooting all the time, every day and night and uh, still killing people. So this is how, you know, like um, again, um, metaphor how life could go through or going on even in a burned environment. And it was back in 2020. And of course, here is a current picture of one of the scene in Ukraine, one of the scenery of Ukraine, summertime. 
talking about water, Ole Föderau made this very powerful work that could be again uh, per perceived in different ways during the <clears throat> peaceful time, but now she's uh, knee high in the water, uh, totally equipped and you know, for the rain, uh, waiting for the rain. So now it's kind of like perception of this work changes a little bit. And when war started, she actually didn't even think about any kind of uh, media, spe special media. She took some fabric, she took some <coughs> charcoal or anything that could, she could write. And she literally wrote very rigid, very uh, strong messages to Russians that bite me and you wear your teeth on me, tear me and you crush your clothes on me, beat me and you'll break yourself. I'm standing, I will stand and you will better run away while you can. So fabrics here actually quite, uh, you know, very personal. It's, uh, it's either domestic or uh, kind of like personal use for fabric. So it's very um, sensual work although it's very um, straightforward and uh, simple. So these two works are right now in the gallery in New York. I, this is a picture from that gallery. It's another messages uh, on the fabrics. And uh, uh, there is an exhibition in New York right now, uh, women, uh, Ukrainian women against war. And she takes uh, part in it. Another artist, uh, Maria Kurikovska, she was born in Crimea, in Kerch. And she was, uh, when in 2014, when uh, Russian occupied Crimea, she was a refugee from Crimea in Ukraine. And she was number 254. So the same year, 2014, during the uh, year of occupation, uh, occupation uh, happened in the beginning of, I think it was 1st of March. So she went to Manifesta. 10, which was held in Hermitage. Manifesta, it's a uh, biennial, uh, nomadic biennial of contemporary art, European uh, biennial of, uh, of European contemporary art. So uh, that year it was in uh, St. Petersburg in Hermitage and she was there and she was laying down uh, uh, covered with Ukrainian flag. Uh, for a long period of time, people were mostly uh, ignorant. Uh, you know, nobody so, uh, especially paid any attention except for police. So she was uh, escorted by police uh, <coughs> from this uh, performance. If you are going to her uh, website, you could see a video of this es escort. She repeated this performance. Uh, Maria Kulikovska, she lived after she uh, fled from Ukraine, uh, from, from uh, Crimea. She lived in Kiev. She was uh, working in Donbass, she was working in Mariupol, she was working uh, in, uh, in Europe, of course, but she fled from uh, Kiev, where she was living lately, with her newborn child. So she was, uh, the child was about three months old. So she lives in uh, Austria, and this is in Berlin. She made this performance, and of course, it's totally different um, attention to this performance. and. Uh, the director of the gallery came out and hugged her, and it was, um, you know, different way uh, to, per to, to perceive. Uh, Maria Kulikovska also um, kind of like famous uh, in Ukraine by installation uh, of her series of installation of her body. So back when she was in Academy, uh, Kiev Academy of Art, she uh, casted her body first time, and then, you know, she was using this cast all the time for different reasons. And, uh, for example, like in the um, Odessa Museum right now, her sculpture of her body made of soap filled with flowers. Uh, so it's not necessarily dramatic, but she also made this installation in Donbass, in Donetsk. And uh, uh, after she installed her figure in Donetsk, uh, some separatists, pro-Russian separatists came and they were shooting those figures. And it was back in 2015. Uh, they were shooting these figures, uh, using them as a target, just to, you know, train in shooting. And uh, later on, she um, repeated it herself as part of Swiss Ukrainian film, The Forgotten. It's, it was filmed about uh, people in Donetsk and we could see the very short um, part of this film.
So the film was shot in 2019. So this is Maria Kulikovska works uh, right now. It's again a film horror of the war kind of series. And uh, she's doing it in uh, Germany, in Austria. Uh, of course, plates, uh, it's quite a contrast of content, uh, what is on the plan, plate. And uh, next uh, artist I would like to introduce, it's Natalia Lisova. And Natalia Lisova was born in Vinitsa. It's part of, again, Ukrainian city <clears throat> in the middle of Ukraine. Um, she moved to Kyiv. She still lives in Kyiv, like through the war, she was staying in Kyiv. And this work was made in 2015, and it was she was taking part in a, a number of environmental festivals. And it, of course, it's uh, in a kind of like outside of war, it's kind of a piece, environmental piece of um, un uniting uh, with the soil, with the land. But during the war, this perception of this piece is totally different. It's her naked body on the uh, land, unprotected uh, land, and uh, a lot of, you know, different association with this. Uh, her other piece, very sensual um, and beautiful. It's, um, again, it's environmental in the good times, and uh, it's uh, very uh, patriotic in the uh, bad times. So she excluded herself. She's not there in the picture. It's kind of like general, hug of the tree, general hug, hug of the nature from environmental point of view, and of course, general hug of Ukrainian tree in this context of the war. One of her works as well, uh, overdone. Uh, I don't think we need any notes here, apparent color and stuff, and the fee. So what we have to pay fee for, uh, your own land, with your own soil. Of course, Ukraine has very special soil. Chernozum, it's uh, one of the best and most rich soils. Uh, but disregarding of that, it's also country that they trying to defend Ukrainians. Natalia is taken, uh, she lives again in Kiev, but she's traveling around Ukraine uh, and she's going to Western part of Ukraine where a lot of refugees from Kharkiv, from uh, Mariupol, from the places that were taken occupied by Russians or um, attacked by Russians uh, constantly. Uh, so she's working, making workshops, performance workshops with uh, teenagers, with kids. And you could see on the top on, on, the, on the left, it's somebody's treating the tree. So it's kind of like environmental uh, love to your um, land uh, workshops. Daria Kaltsova. Daria Kaltsova is uh, uh, another artist, and we probably will finish with her works here. Uh, she was also born in Kharkiv. She was uh, quite traveling. Uh, she, she moved to Kiev. She was working in Odessa uh, two past uh, years before the war. And when war started, she now between London and Berlin. So this particular piece is addressed to um, uh, windows in Ukraine. Of course, it's kind of like trying to protect windows from the explosions. Uh, I was talking with my uh, friend in Ukraine and I asked him about uh, windows, how windows look in Kharkiv. And he says, oh, they all taped, of course, in different ways. And, and if there was, uh, you know, again, any kind of like possibility to breathe, he probably, he said, I would go and make a pictures because some people putting crosses on them, some people making squares, some people, people making some kind of, uh, you know, compositions. Uh, on purpose or not, uh, they're all different. And um, so kind of like artistic in a way, but they of course cannot protect those powerful um, explosions, but at least maybe protecting people who stay nearby or from their being uh, hurt. So this Daria Kutsova's work actually became a uh, flash bomb. Uh, this is a work in Poland, you could see on the uh, right side. Uh, in uh, Kiev apartment on the left side. Uh, uh, when I learned that it was um, in her, um, she doesn't have a website yet, but in her portfolio, it was exactly 58 different countries. Uh, I made my uh, windows in New Hope, uh, Pennsylvania, 
just straight before I made this lecture for the first time. And uh, actually, she told me that it's many more, not 50, 58. Uh, I, I, I still insisted on number 59 being there, but uh, in, the, in the list. But uh, it is it is a nice uh, kind of like support of, you know, to undertake this project and make windows and send it to me or to her. We can figure out how it can go after the presentation. And here her works, uh, Daria's works, she was making installation in uh, Normandia and uh, it was an installation uh, with a part of mural around the gallery. And then when she was taking it down, she also created this piece. I want to uh, stress her words that I just want to know who we will become when the pain is gone. And it's really a question because a lot of uh, destruction and a lot of hate, uh, uh, hatred on both sides is happening. Another work of her, it's uh, counting, uh, we of course count days of the war, and today's uh, 170th day, uh, but also she was counting uh, kids uh, killed during the wars. She claims, I mean, she lost her child at some point herself, and she mourning every, every uh, child that uh, killed uh, during the war. It's more than 350 children right now, and here is her... Um, a lullaby performance. Mm
So in uh, in uh, January of past, uh, this year, I was in Moscow uh, creating installation. This is a model of the monument of the relationship, international relationship. So I, the idea was to have a cool relationship, not cold not war, not hot war. Uh, the temperature was supposed to be 59 or 15 uh, by, by Fahrenheit and uh, 15 by Celsius. So this uh, exhibition was um, taken down in February 20th and four days later, of course, um, it was rejected by the war. And uh, here is a fourth block, it's Association of Graphic Designs, the designers who uh, held International Triennial in Kharkiv, Ukraine. And here is a, one of the posters from this uh, association. So in Ukrainian, it will be Trimaimos. In English, we are hold on. So staying, thank you. Thank you so much, Irina, um, for taking us through all of that. It's very um, generous. We've got some time for questions, and I'm wondering if anyone has a question for Irina. Well, I've got a question. <laughs> Um, and it's a personal question. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Or, but I just, I wondered, um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, you've obviously been in communication with a number of these artists. And um, it's one thing to see their work, and it, but it's quite another thing for them to share about what it's like living and making in um, in that place. And I wonder if you could just share a little bit about any insights you have or anything they've shared with you about the experience of, um, I mean, you've taken us through what they actually make. I'm talking about what it's like to be an artist when your country's being invaded. Yeah, uh, well, some of them, uh, you could see works uh, previous years, mostly, I uh, showed works of previous years, except for Olya Fyodorova and uh, Kulikovska. Maria Kulikovska, because uh, they are continue working. I, I think it depends on the art or, mm -hmm. and artist themselves, what, what kind of art they were doing. Um, so everybody finds some way to, uh, you know, like Prashkovska was performing with her tool and she's continued to perform. Um, it's absolutely, uh, non-human condition let's mm -hmm. put this way the war is not human condition it's i think everybody understand it and um, to create a new works uh, except for works uh, that you know rigorous against the war uh, it's absolutely impossible mm -hmm. this time so uh, in, in, in a way art does lose a lot lose a lot of uh, creativity because because uh, it's shut down it's not working it's not mm -hmm. you know it's not possible so the only thing they uh, create it's it's either stand against uh, be strong or show the horrors uh, in different ways that's, that's the only way to uh, you know to either withstand war or to uh, illustrate it in a way, you know, so those um, pictures of horror, it's kind of like illustration of what happens. Mm -hmm. Trying to um, give away, you know, trying to probably some kind of therapy in a way, uh, just to be able to understand what, what happens in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, please. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about your own life and how you got here, for instance. My own life, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I have family here. My son lives here, so I'm I'm trying to be as open as possible here in in Melbourne. And uh, uh, again, thank you to my dear friends who created this possibility to perform. 
I, I made this first installation, uh, first presentation. It was a little bit longer because it was longer time frame uh, in uh, Franklin Furnace uh, uh, organization in New York. It's one of the oldest organizations uh, for uh, avant-garde art. And they, uh, when war started, they uh, connected to me because I am kind of like alumni of Franklin Furnace. And they connected to me and they said, you know what, we have these events. Uh, it's not every week event, it's, uh, I think it's every month, so once in a while event, uh, Loft, and they invited me to prepare anything for Loft. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't dare to make any kind of like performance installations myself. I wanted to bring Ukrainian artists and to give them a chance to be seen and heard. Where did you study? I studied in uh, Kharkiv, Ukraine. I finished the Kharkiv Art Academy and then I uh, finished uh, MFA in New York. I live in New York. I have to say that I live in New York uh, many, many years. So I'm Ukrainian only by uh, uh, birth and, uh, you know, and development as a young person. Uh, I lived also in Moscow for eight years before I came to the United States. So I kind of like have a uh, trifocal view on all these mm. events. Okay. I have a lot of friends in, in Russia and you know I have a lot of uh, friends who understand what, what's happening. Uh, it's a horrible situation in Russia, it's regime and those people who understand what is happening, adequate people, I would say, uh, <clears throat> they're in, in, in a horrible condition right now too. So I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard not only on the Ukrainian part, but also of course on the Russian part. Although most of Russian people are poisoned by propaganda and you know, you, everybody knows. Yeah, please. Uh, I was just wondering um, just what's really got more reach um, in fact in general, but what advice or context can offer into being able to reckon, reconcile and like um, reconcile feelings of you know um, helplessness and also like helplessness and being able to um, what what advice can you give like outreaching to families who are um, you know uh, either involved or maybe on the brink of war. Uh, you, you're talking about families that uh, pro-Russian or family uh, uh, in Ukraine. I mean, it's different, different. If it's pro-Russian, I don't have any advice. I mean, I was trying, you know, I have a number of former friends, I would say, who I, I was trying to bring to the reality. And it's absolutely, it's, it's, it's incredible what happened in Russia. It's incredible psychological. It's, it's, I think it's even worse than uh, fascists of, in Germany, although it's kind of like the same way. They were kind of like, uh, trying to repeat what they were doing, but it's <clears throat> it's it's really uh, impossible to it's it's uh, uh, Lev Rubinstein. We have this poet who recently wrote in his essay that it's kind of like beyond the logic, like under the logic before Aristotle. You know, like uh, it, like they got some kind of like uh, into some uh, cells that outside of logic, outside of whole entire culture. And, uh, and they got, you know, poisoned there. So I, I have to say, I, you know, I, I tried so like with my former, some of my former friends to um, try to logically, uh, I, I don't have any, I, I, I don't know what to do. They, they don't have logic anymore. They really uh, stripped of logic. So if you, I, I just can say, I don't know. You know, it's 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 supposed to be some psycho, psychologist, uh, um, some, I don't know, it's supposed to be, first, I think it's supposed to be regime changed, which may be impossible for another 70 years or 100. Uh, unfortunately, I hope much earlier, but um, yeah, it's it's a loss. It's, it's a loss. It's not even forgotten. It's lost people there. Unfortunately, it's lost generation. Mm -hmm. Although they live fine, you know, they live inside of Russia. They are fine. They are comfortable. So, but it's we're talking about morale and you know and understanding what they are. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Th
uh, world. Mike, yes. Sorry, thank you. Question. Um, do you think you know the coronavirus and the lockdowns and you know, how this all happened? Do you think there's any connection or just a coincidence or I just um with the you know do you know like um do you have a very different opinion? I don't think any coronavirus. Uh, uh, Putin was, you know, even early when he came to power, and you know, we, I'm, I, I actually, I am, I have dual citizenship, Russian and American, and. Uh, I have to apply to Ukrainian citizenship to get it because of my birth uh, right. But uh, uh, I, I left Soviet Union when uh, from Moscow, so I got this, you know, straight connection to Russia. Um, when Putin came to power, a lot of uh, people in the West they were kind of like, "Oh, young, you know, and energetic," and he was talking about democracy, about and and. Uh, Somebody asked me, what do you think about Putin? I didn't know him much. Nobody knew him because he's from KGB, secret service. But I said, you know, he's from KGB. I don't trust him. And what he's doing right now, he started it a long time ago, before coronavirus. It's all this propaganda, you know, and all this kind of uh, uh, patriotic, so to speak, you know, like race and fake, actually. And uh, so... Yeah, I mean, fake because we know what it is right now, and you know what, how it looks this patriotism and stuff. So it was it was many years before the COVID. I don't know if COVID. I don't think so actually. COVID is another problem. Is there a disconnection with um, people from anyway? Yeah, it it could be you know yeah, but stay home, watch TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I found that there are two uh, two different people in Russia. Some watch TV and some don't. Literally don't, because TV is lying and lying for the long time. Mm -hmm. And those who doesn't doesn't don't watch TV, of course, as they have, had access to Europe, to you know, to other countries, they know something about it. And those who watch TV, they don't have any idea that they cannot go outside of Russia. They, you know, poor people, of course. Got one more question. Sure. Um, I wonder if you could talk about women and talk about um, do you think that what's going on artistically in the Ukraine is being led by women? Is there an, I mean, you showed us uh, work by women, and um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about. Um, gender and yeah yeah um, I didn't plan to show work only with women and, and there are some men inside of my presentation but uh, you know I when I was uh, I was thinking myself that uh, by chance I really I really uh, have ma majority of people and actually they you know I, I I was reaching to curators in Ukraine uh, that I knew uh, from you know years of uh, collaboration and uh, they were telling me about these artists. So I didn't know them actually before I started to prepare the program. Um, so it happened to be that it's women artists. Mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, and you know, then I saw about it and I thought uh, war is kind of like still male thing. You know, it's not female thing. It, I, it, although, you know, I'm very feministic and nothing could be, you know, like separated this and that, but uh, yeah, women are against war. It's actually, I mean, there are a lot of men against war, but it makes uh, kind of like very deep uh, meaning to it. You know, it's, it's uh, so in this collection, it's by chance because actually my um, former classmate, he was uh, pre presenting Ukraine in uh, Venice Biennial and he had a beautiful piece, but nothing to do with war, you know? And so I kind of like, because he was thinking about this piece long before the war and, and Biennial started in April, but, uh, so I didn't bring it because it was not, you know, mm -hmm. not in, but yeah, it's it's by chance, I would say, but it's kind of like makes sense yeah. from this point of view, because yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for your generosity. And, and um, I don't know if I was, it was just great to see, um, well, great's not the right word, just incredibly moving to see what people are making um, in a country that we, well, I certainly just watch on the news and I don't really know very much about the art that's in production. So um, I, I really appreciate your sharing that with us today. Please 
whether you're in Zoom land or here in Federation Hall, please thank our guest speaker, Irina. Thanks. Likewise, the same reason. <laughs> it's it is a support of Ukraine in support of Ukraine information about Ukraine. So, thank you very much for coming.